Hello, this is Tim at lovechangegrow.com and this video is concerning the ITA process part two, the Involuntary Treatment Act um, in Washington State, where I practice for about the past 30 years. Uh, so the intent of this series, which is a three part series, is to post uh, information or present information about the process of uh, involuntary commitment, evaluation and commitment. Very few folks have access to this information. And so last week was part one, um, where I presented the general conceptual overviews of the process. And this week in part two, will be more of the nitty gritty details of how this works. Um, and then part three, which will be next week, will present some of the other factors that a lot of folks aren't necessarily aware of. So let me start first off with a disclaimer. This is general information. It's not intended to be construed or taken as advice recommendations, consultation, um, or treatment. So the best is to contact your local community uh, crisis services team or law enforcement if you need help, consultation, or services. So um, I'm trying to make a lot of what I present in this series to be generally applicable to wherever you are um, in the United States. Um, on the other hand, uh, my experience has been in Washington State, so I will present from that point of view. But uh, so contact your local services, your local um, folks, because they'll be able to more accurately uh, describe what you need to do. But this is just kind of a conceptual kind of thing. So let's start out here. Um, in this process, um, let me switch here to, so you can sort of think that, think of that in the process of actually evaluation and detaining, there's four separate phases. It's an easy way to think about it. So the first phase, oh, let me uh, say, refer to this uh, piece of paper right here. It sh will be in the post. So I did this years ago, a couple decades ago when I was doing a, quite a bit of training, is that you can think of this as four separate phases. The first phase is the referral process. You can think of that as um, sort of a passive information is coming into, uh, into me or the, the involuntary treatment officer and we're hearing complaints and basically collecting information um, passively passively, meaning that we're not going out and asking for the information. The information is coming in and we're just receiving it. We're collecting uh, kind of concerns. Um, if somebody, sometimes folks just have questions or, or they're like, oh my gosh, I need help. Well, what do I do? And so in that kind of process, we often say, well, you can do this, 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 and this. And we give them a range of, of options that, that they can consider and figure out which is appropriate. And then they may say, well, here is this person. This is where they are. This is what's happening. This is how I know. Um, so it's, it's kind of a report. They're just reporting to us. And so that's generally the referral process. So in this referral process, we often get mostly referrals from uh, primarily the emergency uh, room or the emergency department of the local hospital. 
Um, that often comes with police reports and also reports from family or the family may be um, in the ER or have helped bring the person in as a voluntary um, and the person has been the client has been you know okay I'll go with you we'll go in I'm, I need some help that kind of stuff and so um, that's primarily the uh, the referral process so it comes in from 911 police uh, sometimes uh, this is rarely the case now, but there are still cases where uh, a family member will invite us to come out and see their, uh, their, their individual person or be a part of the family. And um, when we do outreaches, we almost always say, look, we're, we need to be invited into the home. Um, and because we can come, like I mentioned last week, we can come and knock on the door and the door can be closed. But if a family member says, hey, I'm here, come see me. And here's the, the our other, uh, our son or our daughter or uh, aunt, uncle, whatever. And, and so they're basically inviting us in. Um, if it was up to the client, they could sh shut the door and we can't come in. So um, there's a, a few reasons for that is one is to be able to basically be invited into the home or where the person's at. The other thing is um, we do screening. Uh, we want to know if there's guns, dogs, weapons, uh, because we want to be safe. We don't want to go into somebody's home and find out, oh, my gosh, this is uh, quite dangerous or um there's risk involved, and I have certainly had cases where I've gone in and basically go, oops, sorry, I'm in the wrong place, never mind, and leave, because um, the, the basically the environment isn't secure. There's uh, been times when I've had family members say, hey, I'll meet you at the house, and they haven't been answering the door, but we know they're there, um, and there perhaps hasn't been a history of violence, but the, the, the family believes the person has access to guns or, or weapons. And so um, kind of depending, you know, it's, it's these outreaches are generally well screened with good reason. And if there's concerns, um, as an involuntary treatment officer, we always have the option to say, hey, law enforcement, come in with us. You know, we don't know what the situation is, or there's reports that um, we there's some risk there. So we have them come along. Their job is primarily to um, secure the environment, protect the client from and protect the community, protect themselves and us. Um, I've also had cases where the police have asked me to come in, and I get there, and they basically, basically said, okay, great, you're here, and we're going to secure the environment first. And once that's secure, we can, and the person, the identified client is uh, secure in, in a sense, then we'll come in. Uh, and each community does things differently. Um, and so, you know, you develop these relationships and these understandings. For instance, um, I've practiced where there are Native American tribes or uh, reservations, um, but the tribes are um, sovereign in the sense that some tribes will say, look, we have a tribal member and we want you to evaluate them, but we have to be escorted in basically or invited in by the tribal police uh, that represent sort of the tribal council. Um, so I practiced in that way. Um, I've had also other tribes say, okay, we'll get the person 
and let's meet at the tribal center. Um, and so we'll do that. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, another example was um, with some law enforcement municipalities or cities, um, villages, towns, they say, hey, you're the one in charge. I'm the one in charge. I show up on the scene. I get to direct it. We secure the environment. And I've had instances where law enforcement asked me, should we break down the door? And I go, no, no, no. We don't need to do that. Let's get a hold of the apartment manager or the landlord and see if we can have the door unlocked by them. So, um, there's all kinds of, that's sort of the referral piece. Um, then the difference here is, I guess, one of the presumptions in the referral piece that folks may not understand, the referral piece is just, we're collecting information. The underlying presumption is the identified client still has their voluntary rights, their rights of sovereignty. Um, and so we have to respect that. Now, at the second phase, which is the investigation, the difference is we read them their rights or Mirandize them. And at that point, then there is the conceptual piece where I, as the ITA officer, it is establishing, um, that this work now begins under my authority of uh, involuntary treatment officer, which in the state of Washington is basically, uh, I, in this small little world of mental health crisis, is that I have the power of basically uh, somewhat like a county sheriff in that I can suspend this person's civil rights and say, no, we're talking, we're here, um, you can't leave. Um, and so from some folks uh, standpoint, that's, you can sort of see that the equivalent would be an interrogation on the criminal side. On the, on the civil side of the law is we've read their rights, we need to figure this out. And so there are times when a person does an outreach, we read their rights, and there's various practice, practices or protocols, community standards, I should say. Some, in some counties, I've worked in five different counties, some counties say, okay, you've read their rights, you need to have a better, uh, secure them better, and if you're out in the community or perhaps in their home, um, if you have the intention, if I have the intention that, boy, this is a concerning case and let's figure this out. And part of this is I need the identified client in a more secure place. I can move them to the ER against under the idea that this is a temporary detainment. Am I going to detain them? I don't know. So it's it's an investigation, a temporary kind of, of thing. Now, other counties I've practiced where is, if I'm meeting the person out on the streets or in their home, I can't move them until I am very, pretty much reasonably uh, going to detain them. So that's a little bit of a different community standard. Um, I've practiced in other counties where they, we have a thing called a custody authorization. And so um, in the referral process, the case um, sounds very concerning. We're so concerned, we don't know where the person is. Um, and so we issue to local law enforcement um, what's called a custody authorization. So we request the law enforcement officer to go out and find this person. We think they're here or there or wherever. They're, this is what they look like. Oftentimes law enforcement already know knows who the person we're talking about is. Um, and so we issue this 
paper document basically saying under our authority we would like you to pick them up and bring them to us so once they make contact they contain the person get the person uh, perhaps in the their police car they can call us and we can either go out and see them or we'll often say bring them to the emergency department at the local hospital i'll meet them there and so that's based under uh the ita officer's authority so there's i just wanted to make folks aware um and this is the important piece of why you want to contact your local services because different counties different cities um, operate differently so once I've read the rights and I've basically said, okay, we're doing basically an in, in interrogation. They've been advised that they can talk with an attorney. This is why, this is who I am. This is why I'm doing this. Um, and uh, so then once I've read the rights, this becomes the active phase where I can then actively go out and try to find more um, information and so um, in this piece then um, my role as ITA officer is that I am no longer bound by confidentiality as long as I ha am in this active phase of looking for more information so let's say that i have the person in the er we're trying to figure out what's going on i hear these stories and so i can call up and say hi i'm tim i'm the local ita officer i have your family member here um and they're safe and stuff but i am investigating whether um, your family member needs to be in a psychiatric unit either voluntarily, involuntarily, or that we they're free to go. So I say, Joe, your brother, or Joe, whoever it is, I can go and look for information, contact various parties, identify the person. Um, now, if the person is... Um, voluntarily and i have not read the rights or anything i can't go out and do that because then that's a breach of confidentiality um so in practice a lot of ita officers just start from oh here here you are we're concerned i'm reading and or advising you of your rights reading your rights um here's your rights and and are you willing to speak with me and generally the majority of folks are willing to. Occasionally, folks um, don't want to speak or are afraid to speak with us. And um, in Washington, it, again, in some counties, um, the person has access to uh, an attorney immediately. Um, and that can be in one of two forms. They have a family attorney or a personal attorney they can call 24 7 and say hey um, or um, in some counties there is an on-duty public defender who will step in and say if the identified client wants to talk with an attorney we go okay and dial the number hand them our fo the phone and say there's their, your attorney um, as you when you speak with your attorney I'm gonna step out of the room and by the way, I would like to speak with the attorney when you're done to find out what their instructions are. Um, as a result of that, I've had a few attorneys say, I'm instructing you, involuntary treatment officer, not to ask any further questions. I will be in in 45 minutes, half an hour, and we'll sit down and I will be present while you conduct the rest of your evaluation which is fine, that's a person's uh, rights. And if that uh, is available, great. Um, I've had personal family attorneys that, of the client um, say, oh, okay, great. 
I don't want them to talk any longer. I've instructed them not to talk and you can proceed with your evaluations, but I've instructed them not to say anything. And that's, that's fine. Um, I've had other um, attorneys say, oh, I've told Joe to go ahead and cooperate and, and we'll figure this out. So there's a whole range of stuff in, in, in the rights piece. Um, in the active piece, I can call um, perhaps another facility that may have, may have records. Um, and so I call up the unit or the outpatient treaters and say, hey, I'm Tim, I'm doing this involuntary evaluation. I understand you treat this person or they're under your care in the outpatient world or they have uh, spent some time in your facilities would you send me the records would you talk to me would you uh, what was their diagnosis you know what's your treatment plan when did you last see them and all that kind of stuff now that party doesn't have to talk to me. They can say, look, I'm uncomfortable with this. You know, I feel it's a evaluate. It's a, um, uh, oh, we're just one, went out of, it's, it's against their best interest. I'm bound by confidentiality. I'm not going to talk to you. And that's fine. You know, all I can say is, look, under the Washington state statutes, in this involuntary evaluation process, you can relax your concerns about confidentiality and speak with me. I can't force that to happen, but I would like that to happen. And by me contacting you, you know, explaining the situation, hopefully you'll go, oh yeah, we're concerned. We think the person needs to be in the psychiatric unit. We'll talk with you. Now, to go a little bit on, this, on, on a, a side note about that is you can view the involuntary treatment officer going out and getting records and that kind of thing as also a form of advocacy in that if we collect information, then basically I... I, as the um, involuntary treatment officer during this investigation, if I detain either or the person goes into the hospital voluntarily, I can send this other information that I've collected from other hospitalizations or the outpatient treatment team so that the receiving inpatient psychiatric team has a bit of a head start as far as clinical information and other things. So they're not starting from zero. So the idea that it's advocacy is that in that there's a, the, the client comes in with a bunch of information and the inpatient treatment has um, then access to that and hopefully they can figure treatment out quicker, a shorter hospitalization and that kind of thing. There are times certainly when a person comes into a psychiatric unit and basically um, the, the involuntary treatment officer and therefore if they're hospitalized either voluntarily or involuntarily, there's very little information. Um, if a person goes into the hospital voluntarily, there's a presumption, okay, you want to be in there, give us a release of information so that we can go and get records. Um, and so that's, um, I'll get to that in, in a bit. So let's move on here. So mm, let me look here. So during the, the, this interview, this interrogation, we're collecting a lot of information. And so um, in um, the post here, I'm just going to, I've decided just to put out notes. And a lot of these notes are um, from trainings I've done in the past. I've edited it some, but I figure I'm just going to give you the full Monty and uh, give you, you know, here's 
basically what we do. And I know that we're not going to go over all of this. And if you have questions, I'd say go and ask, go and do some searching. Um, because I don't know what you don't know. And I don't want to go through the whole thing, but I believe that you can figure it, it out what, from the notes. So um, in these notes, the, the primary thing, the bread and butter of involuntary, voluntary um, hospitalization piece is what's called the mental status exam. And so I've given you a fairly detailed idea of the mental status exam, what we're looking for. We're basically trying to describe verbally a picture of what the clinical presentation is. And so that's this whole mental status exam of judgment, insight, lethality, uh, information, intelligence, memory, orientation, all that. So. The mental status exam is we're putting together a picture and this picture, the mental status is a clinical tool that basically all professionals have been trained in or if they haven't been, they should be because that's sort of the shorthand. This is the data. This is the data and from the data, you, whether it's me or the receiving psychiatrist is going to say, oh, okay, this sounds like uh, a, a schizophrenic or a bipolar or a personality disorder, all that kind of uh, diagnostic stuff. So, um, you, we're basically using this mental status exam is here's the picture. Based on the picture, we're going to say we have a clinic, uh, a diagnostic impression. And from that diagnostic impression, then here's what we think would be a reasonable intervention to address the needs of the patient or the client that's going to ensure their safety, their well-being, and at what level of intervention. And intervention can mean, you know, medications, it can be mean containment, um, it can mean detox services, all kinds of things. But the, so that piece is basically the clinical formulation of why is this happening and what needs to be done about it. Um, in the process, we're also trying to eliminate or rule out things like um, substance abuse, um, organic things or uh, medical things, neurological things such as, you know, if a person is older and they really haven't been taking care of themselves, you know, we're, we're going to be asking for um, UAs for uh, to rule out or to eliminate the possibility of a urinary tract infection in an elderly person will make them psychotic. And uh, so, you know, we would not want to put a person in a psychiatric unit because they are psychotic when that psychosis is related to a urinary tract infection. So. You know, oftentimes in the ER we'll say, hey, this looks like, or the doc will say, hey, we got a urinary tract infection, they're psychotic, and but we really don't know what's the underlying baseline or normal functioning of this person. We hear allegations that they have a history of mental illness or and all this other stuff. Um, it could also be there's cases where it's a medication issue. I countless of times we've been called into the into these cases and it's a medication interaction. Um, a classic one these days is a person comes in and they're just you know, are what we call delirious. They don't really understand what's going on, what's happening. They're just 
and La La Land. And so it's those are kind of things where we're looking for. Is this um, too much fentanyl <laughs> and it's caused the psychosis? Is this um, perhaps some um, liver functioning and they have too much ammonia and that's causing the psychosis? And so the nice thing about why we have people go into the ER is those medical kind of issues um, are addressed so those are ruled out. Ideally, all that stuff is ruled out before they call us in. Now, there's sometimes when I'm, I'm bringing a person from the community, I'm calling up the ER and say, hey, I'm Tim, I'm bringing this person in, you know, here's what we think, can you do the medical piece? So they're, they're drawing labs, they're, you know, doing their medical piece, ruling out all this stuff. They do that and say, look, no, the, there's no medical issues that should be causing this. So this is a mental health issue. Come on in and see them. Um, so one of the things about this in these days, since there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse, generally we want the person fairly well detoxed or at least we know what's on board because when we come in and do our mental status is that if the person's under the influence of, of whatever, opiates, uh, methamphetamine, alcohol, um, any hallucinogens and stuff, when we try to do a mental status exam, all we can really con kind of conclude or our impression is they're intoxicated. Well, a person being intoxicated doesn't mean they really are in need of or require uh, a psychiatric hospitalization. So generally, a lot of times that we try to wait, um, such as in, in alcohol, we want to see their blood alcohol level decreasing, you know, as expected. Um, until they're down to, you know, below 1.0, preferably more towards 0.5 um, before we'll get in there and say, okay, let's see, you know, we can attribute a bit of this to the influence of alcohol, but mainly here is as a person detoxes, you know, the theory is that their mental health issues will become more evident or blossom, emerge. And so then when that happens, we can then say, yeah, they came in intoxicated or under the influence of methamphetamine, but we've given them, you know, 12 hours or 24 hours. They've kind of come around and now they're presenting as, um, agitated they're still hallucinating and and all this stuff and we've given them medications but this still is quite significant in that their mental um status is continues to be quite disruptive so this looks more like a mental health issue okay um so let's get down to uh so Clinical treatment, you basically, what's, is, can this be prescribed to a mental disorder and not a substance abuse or a medical condition or a medication condition or a neurological condition or a Alzheimer's, dementia kind of thing? Um, so then the next piece is, is it clinical appro clinically appropriate? Does Psychiatric hospitalization is that clinically appropriate for the presentation of this mental disorder. Um, then the next question is, is it necessary and the least restrictive treatment? What is the least restrictive treatment and is it necessarily necessary? So then um, and is it in the best interest? And sometimes some of these cases, you, you end up wondering, who is the client? Is this the identified 
you know, client, or is it somebody in the family, or the, is is really this person? Yes, they're you know off the wall and psychotic and all this other stuff, but it's the community that's concerned. And so there's you know sometimes you when things don't make sense, you got to kind of back up out and get a bigger perspective and say who's really the client. Um, I had a mentor when I was first starting out that said, hey, if a case just is confusing, it's not coming together, you know, it, it's not making sense. On one hand, you have to pay attention to the case right in front of you. On the other hand, you have to develop this awareness out here where you can take the bigger 10,000 foot perspective and go where's the liability where's the money where's the anxiety in the community in the family um, and by often getting outside of just being in the case in your face you can then you the issues become more clear and um, the concerns you understand the concerns where they're coming from and stuff um, so this next piece is the uh, causal nexus, and it's five pieces of evidence that are required in order to for an ITA officer to go ahead and do a detainment. Now, so so far we've had a temporary detainment, but now the question is a detainment into a psychiatric unit. So you need five pieces of evidence. First um, off, you have the complaint, which is that act, that referral piece. You need a solid referral. I just can't go out and knock on somebody's door and say, oh, by the way, let's do this. You know, I have no complaint. You need a complaint. You need a relatively significant complaint to start the evaluation. If you don't have that, you can't proceed. If you do proceed, uh, at I'll talk about this later, probably next week. If I don't have a significant complaint, it can get thrown out and nothing proceeds. So, um, you know, it's basically for us, for me to start an evaluation, there needs to be reasonable cause or concern. And that's documented basically by police reports, um, statements from the family, um, and that is generally the basis. Um, but the, the, the complaint also goes back to, if I have a reasonable complaint or significant complaint, then I can issue custody authorizations. Um, and that then I can read them their rights and start a formal investigation. So that's the complaint piece. That's piece number one, evidence number one. So the second piece is the mental illness, and that's the mental status piece. And there's a difference between a diagnosis and in the state of Washington, it's called a mental disorder. Well, the mental disorder basically means signs and symptoms that substantially uh, adverse a person's cognitive and volitional functioning, meaning their ability to understand and their ability to have will, um, to willfully, you know, conduct their business uh, however they see fit for the most part. So they understand, hey, I have a goal. This is my goal-directed behaviors. So there's a volition there. Um, if a person's mental status is so disrupted that they don't understand what's going on, they don't aren't able to form a goal-directed behavior, um, or their goal-directed behavior is a matter of dangerousness, then 
um, we have a mental disorder. So in court, I can't say, generally, uh, only docs or PhD levels, uh, expert witnesses can say, this is a di this is the diagnostic picture, you know, basically saying, hey, this is why um, this is happening. It actually, um, in a lot of courts, the involuntary treatment officer cannot make a diagnosis. So what's left for them to do is to describe uh, the actions via the mental status exam that would lead the court to go, oh my gosh, this person must have schizophrenia or and that and or then the docs, you know, the, the psychiatrist um, or psychologist can say, well, yes, this behavior indicates the person does have this, um, you know, schizophrenia or bipolar affective disorder disorder or depressed or um, what have you and can make the diagnosis. Now, the third piece of um, evidence is endangerment. So the causal nexus, this is the piece that really is the key piece. You have to connect the mental illness that established that and then you have to be able to link the resulting endangerment is a result of that mental disorder. That is the key right there. If you can't do that, then you don't have the causal nexus, which is the key part of being able to detain a person. So um, let me kind of say, we see a lot of people that are just, you can tell they have a mental illness. You can tell they're talking to themselves. They're disheveled. They smell bad. They, it's, you know, you can see it. You know, you know that. But just because the person is acting strangely or bizarrely, are they endangering? And how are they endangering? So... That's the dangerous part. So there's six clauses. There are non-intimate, imminent, and imminent. So we'll, we'll start with the, 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 we'll get back to that here in just a moment. The non-imminent versus, versus the imminent. So basically the six clauses is dangerous, dangerous of serious harm, to themselves, one, harm or assault to somebody else or making threats, and they have a history of threats, of assaults, um, perhaps convictions, um, or that there's a danger to property. And generally, danger to property doesn't mean threats to property. It means that the property damage has already happened. and. The little twist about that is a person can smash their own TV. It's their own TV. You want to smash it. You want to take a sledgehammer to your own car. It's your car. You can do whatever you want. But if you uh, break the window or take a baseball bat because the squirrels are telling you that, you know, they want in the car and you're swinging the bat, and breaking somebody else's windshield, that is danger to property that has happened and you're doing it because the squirrels are whispering at you, telling you them that the nuts are inside the car, okay? And the squirrels want the nuts and you're just helping the poor little squirrels, they're hungry, okay? Well, that is a danger to property. Property damage has happened and it's because the squirrels were telling you, okay? They, the person has lost cognitive understanding, the squirrels in the nuts thing, that just doesn't make sense. They've taken some volitional behavioral action and smashed the window. Boom, danger to property. Or um, let's say a person severely depressed, 
and they're feeling hopeless. They can't think of other resources and things. And so they're suicidal. Okay. And we'll, we'll get to this a bit too. Um, so there's danger to self, danger to others, um, danger to others generally, um, is the threat to a specific person versus a nebulous, oh, I don't like Boy Scouts, <laughs> okay? You know, danger to generalized Boy Scouts is not gonna make it. But if the person says, I don't like this Boy Scout leader or whatever, and that's because of, um, I've noticed the patterns in the leaves of this tree indicates that this Boy Scout leader is a terrible, bad person. And I have a history of assaulting people. I've been, you know, arrested several times for assault or I've had a conviction, you know. Then those kind of things to an identified person, um, a history of assault, then you we're much more likely to hear that and take that versus, oh, the class of Boy Scouts, a class of attorneys, you know, that that's not going to have, going to carry as much weight. Is it concerning? Yes. Can we detain on that? Uh, that's kind of a call. And, and you'll, you'll find out as I go through a lot of this you can always look at things as a, as a spectrum. How likely is this to happen and stuff? Okay, then there is um, also this thing called grave disability. And grave disability can be kind of passive, meaning the person just un doesn't understand their situation and they don't understand that they're not taking care of their physical health and safety needs. They're just oblivious, so psychotic, or just don't understand what's going on. So they're gravely disabled. Now, um, and there's a likelihood of serious harm resulting from failure to provide or their ability to provide essential needs of health and safety, okay? So it's kind of considered, you know, let's say a person is so manic, they're, they just, you know, have so many ideas, pressured speech, they're not sleeping and stuff. And they seem to have, you know, some touch with of reality, but they go, hey, I'm just feeling so good. I got to get this done and that done. I just don't have time to sleep. And they haven't slept for three or four days, okay? Or by reports or by their own admission. Um, and so, you know, you see basically the severe deterioration in their usual functioning and ability, but you're also seeing a repeated or escalating loss of cognitive and volitional control over their actions. And they're not able to go pull back and go, wait a minute, I gotta go sleep, I gotta eat, and that kind of stuff. And so basically they're neglecting um, because they're so focused on this other stuff they wanna get done that they're not um, caring for their essential health and safety needs. Now, um, So, you know, likelihood, we'll get into this, likelihood is kind of imminent and active. You know, when you talk about danger to self, danger to others, uh, property damages, that is um, active. So it's sort of sense of commission, of sense that you're actively trying to do something versus grave disability is you're not really trying to destroy yourself or not take care of yourself. You're just so out there, you don't understand that you need to take care of yourself. Um, and that can be like, hey, you know, um, here's an example. Sometimes people get um, so psychotic, they don't realize, oh, by the way, I gotta take 
take my medications for diabetes, okay? <laughs> and so then it's like, well, geez, they have the, you know, a blood sugar of 500 or whatever they come in and they're just so psychotic they don't realize or have forgotten about or just don't understand, oh yeah, I got this diabetic condition. So they, there is like, oh, okay, you got grave disability. So there has to be a likelihood of serious harm as a result from the mental disorder. Um, there's some notes about that. The fourth piece of, of evidence is what's called eminence. And so you can kind of think of that as, a, as two windows. One is a window of time. Um, and generally, we want to see a time frame of 24, 48 hours, either prior, the person was wandering around out in the the interstate traffic and they didn't know where they were they could have gotten hit and by the grace of god they didn't or they tried to suicide and by the grace of god they didn't uh and they came in and they spent a few days on icu because of they took too much over-the-counter medications in a suicide attempt and so um there's that piece or in the future so so here's, here's how this 24, 48 hour timepiece works. If the person was out wandering around in traffic in the, on the interstate in the median, you know, two weeks ago, well, that behavior doesn't count because it was two weeks ago. So the issue then is why weren't they brought in at that time two weeks ago? Now, if the state patrol just pulled them off the interstate and put them in the car and drove them to the ER and says makes a statement a report hey this person was found on i-5 uh you know 100 yards from the exit ramp and was just you know didn't seem seem to be lost didn't know where they were going tried to flag down cars and things like that and they brought them in great that that's in the 24 48 hour time frame okay now you can also go into the future okay and so then that is like so does the person have intent or plans and means past behaviors and their mental status is so off that you could argue if I don't take care of this now there would be a likelihood, 51% statistically, you know, the more likely that some tragic event would happen versus it wouldn't happen. So um, that kind of, you, you can also look at eminence in a statistical, you know, thing. More likely than not. Likelihood is like 51% or better, okay? Um, so... In the future, we're talking about probability kind of thing, um, that if we didn't take care of this today, in a day or two, we'd likely be seeing the case again. Likely that the person may, you know, be more suicidal or complete a suicide. And so we want to jump in there and take care of this now. Um, so I made a note of light versus heavy cases and that's weighty wise. So, um, the bare minimum to detain is likelihood 51% or better. Now, as cases move through the judicial process of commitment, the longer the commitment, the more weight has to be uh, demonstrated to um, in order to get the judge to make the order for a longer time of commitment. So um, that's why I put preponderance is more like 70, uh, 60, 70, 75 percent because because at the 14 day hearing, you kind of want more weight. So 
you know, what we're doing here on, um, when we're detaining, we can detain on 51%, but if that 51% disappears in the first 120 hours resolved, well, that's great, that's okay, um, but they may not get their treat actual treatment. So um, I'll go ahead and just mention this and hopefully I'll remember to cover it later. So when we detain, um, we're just detaining for the initial 120 hours or five days, excluding Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. So during that initial five days, a person has the right to refuse psychiatric medications. And as long as they're not being severely out of control, threatening to staff, throwing chairs and stuff, the, the inpatient psychiatric team um, can't force medications if the person doesn't want them and they're acting in a reasonable manner, okay? So that first five days, maybe up to seven days, person can say, no, I don't want medications. I'm acting within the range. And so then um, the question of, well, the likelihood, if it was a light case at 51% and the, then the person is in the psychiatric unit and they're, you know, kind of in the ball game, but not causing any problems, well, then the treatment team doesn't really have evidence to, for the 14 day to then start treatment. And so oftentimes those light cases that are barely over 51%, kind of, they either get, they either get cut loose or they're allowed to sign in as a voluntary, which is great. You know, um, we like that. Um, but if the person, you know, comes to the, the, towards the end of their five days and there's like, okay, or in a case of like a, a drug intoxication, they clear up at day three, well, okay, goodbye, you're free to go. So the, the point is psychiatric beds voluntarily or involuntary are very valuable. So um, the ITA officer sort of is acting as a gatekeeper, but also as a triage specialist. So we only have, you know, we have a scarcity of beds. So our, you know, on one hand, we're kind of torn with the idea is we want to make sure we're seeing a person and the people that really need that bed they're going to get the bed or have the availability for that bed. But if we're loading up the, the, the last three psychiatric beds in the county with these light cases, and then here rolls in a case that like, oh my gosh, this person needs to be in the hospital, then, you know, we don't have that option. So we're, we, we're also in a triage role. So the reason I mentioned that is oftentimes you'll see involuntary treatments officers looking for more of the preponderance or the clear, cogent, and convincing, you know, um, because then, you know, we're more reasonably assured those folks with the most need are getting the bed. That's one way to look at this whole eminence thing. Um, and that is up to each individual involuntary treatment officer. You know, that's why we get the duty and responsibility with trying to figure out all this stuff. So here's the last piece of information, which is the legal lesser restrictive. Now, this is in the sense of legal liabilities. When we detain somebody, we have to try to e avoid increased legal liabilities. This does not mean containment or um, the physical apprehension of the body, okay? Um, this means legal liabilities. So the usual example is if a person breaks the law, they've merely broken the law, they go to jail. Boom, that's it. 
there's no presumption that they're not able to to take care of their emotional, mental state and behaviors. When we detain somebody, we're making the allegation or or the or the that the person is not able to handle the emotional and mental behavioral affairs, thus we're detaining. And that carries a lot more legal weight because it's not that the person's broken the law, it's because they are unable to care for themselves, unable to understand what's going on, unable or have this misdirected like hey goals of you know i need to kill myself or kill somebody else or do this you know break into this car because the squirrels are hungry and that kind of thing um and so that that's a big piece of that that people don't understand yes we take a person in and contain them put them into a psychiatric unit for up to five days, they still maintain their right to refuse medications unless they're acting out and behaving very poorly, then the inpatient treatment team can make a case is, I'm gonna give them some medications and a little thing is, is it can't be a routine kind of thing. It needs to be a one-time deal um, because you just medicate them until you know, they can maintain their own health and safety. They're not tearing up the unit. And as soon as that happens and the person's refusing medications, you can't give them more medications until the 14 day commitment. Okay. Um, the other thing is we have to clearly demonstrate, hey, I'm begging you, let's do this voluntarily. And they say, oh, hell no. Or they just don't understand why. Why would I want to be in the hospital? I don't want to be in the hospital. I want to go out and, you know, sleep under the trees and watch the stars and do more methamphetamine or whatever. So um, there's also this thing of poor faith voluntary. Um, it's not a popular concept at, the t at, at this point in time, but it used to be. In, but it's a thing to, to note is that with the presumption of voluntary, okay, the person maybe has an outpatient treatment team, they've been offered various interventions, reasonable interventions, and they have failed, or they won't show up, or they say they'll go, or they won't show up. And so then in the case of when you detain, you go, yes, the person is saying, I wanna be in the hospital, but they ha are not going to treatment they're um, continuing uh, not to take their medications. Their case manager or outpatient person that's tracking them down, you know, where they live and stuff like that, they'll, they'll say yes, but then as soon as that door shuts and the case manager leaves, they're back to just being pretty darn crazy. Um, so, you know, oftentimes, uh, the detainment officer goes, hey, yeah, they're saying they'll be here, but here's the thing is I don't want to let them into the hospital as a voluntary, and then they're there for two hours and say, I want to go. Now, the, the, uh, the hospital generally has to let the person go unless they feel there's endangerment issues, and then they call us back in to do another evaluation four hours later. And it's like, oh, so that's kind of why, um, you know, we're a lot of uh, involuntary treatment officers are looking more towards the, the, the preponderance, um, because especially if a person has a history of failed voluntary kind of, uh, offerings or engagement into treatment. Okay, um, boo, 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 boo. I've talked about some of this other stuff, the legal issues, evidence, um, 
kind of stuff we've kind of gone through. In the state of Washington, the adult uh, mental health laws are the RCW 7105s, minors are 7134. A minor is from the age of their birthday when they become 13 up until the last day they're 17. Once the, the day they turn 18, then they become an adult. Uh, the criminal piece, uh, 1077, is occasionally will get kind of inappropriately called in to on a criminal case, um, and there's some sticky things there um, that maybe I'll get back, get to at some point. Um, but usually that the, the 1077 criminal thing is in the state of Washington, not guilty by reason of insanity. And uh, just for a little side bit, insanity is a legal term. It's not a psychiatric term. And then um, the alcohol and drug and alcohol law, which used to be 7096, um, has now been rolled into and combined with the RCW 7105, which is the mental health law. Um, I think we've gotten through most all of this here. Then we have um, evidence. I think I mentioned last week, you know, it's all opinion, speculation until uh, the evidence or until the testimony is heard from the person's, you know, the involuntary treatment officer, the police, the family, until they speak those words to the judge's ears. Uh, that's the evidence piece. Um, oh, another thing about danger to others. So what the danger to others is what's called reasonable fear. So if a community member or a family has reasonable fear, oh, I'm concerned, they made some threats or uh, what, you know, I'm just afraid of the person. Well, the reasonable fear thing is, what did you do when the client said this to you or the client raised their fist? What did you do? And so did you run away and call the police? And so really kind of the threshold is the police report uh, because otherwise it's kind of a he said, she said kind of thing. It's just like a verbal allegation. So. If a person, uh, a community member is concerned enough to engage the police, to call 911, make a statement, uh, contribute to a police report, um, that's reasonable fear now, or the reasonable fear piece. But that still doesn't become evidence until the person's willing to come in and testify and tell the judge. Okay, and so uh, one way families and, and community can get around coming in to testify is by a police report. Um, you still might, you know, if you write a report and you hand that, hey, this is my witness statement and, and this is part of the police report, the prosecutor may still come in and, and ask if you are willing to come in to testify. But um, oftentimes, you know, a good police report along with your witness statement is like, okay, great. Um, so the, so that's kind of the reasonable fear piece. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so then I think last week I put uh, the various options of how things proceed. Um, that's just the ITA options per 7105. Um, these, this is kind of the process, and I've kind of narrowed things down. There's summons, affidavits of complaint. Uh, basically, there's this thing called the non-emergent petition, if, which results in the non-emergent order. So the non-emergent petition rarely happens, along with the non-emergent order, rarely happens because it's a lot of work and a logistical nightmare. Um, but what it is, basically, um, uh, an involuntary treatment officer can get involved, collect 
all kinds of information, affidavits, uh, reports, and stuff like that. And there can be uh, basically either a face-to-face -face evaluation or no face-to-face -face evaluation. And, you, and the ITA officer takes all this uh, reports and stuff, writes a petition, and, or for actually, technically, gets all this together, talks with the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney says, yeah, this sounds concerning enough go ahead and write it up as a petition. So then the ITA officer writes a petition and schedules uh, a hearing, basically a judicial review, uh, where I would just meet with a superior court judge and say, look, judge, here's all the stuff. And I believe this warrants the person to appear for an ITA evaluation, <laughs> okay? Um, because we can't find them or they're not willing to come in or engage with us, but yet we don't have the eminence piece. So in the five pieces to detain a person, um, that's what we need. But but in the non-emergent P, detention process order, petition and order, is generally we don't have the eminence piece. And so we're asking basically the, the judge to weigh in and say, yeah, this sounds like, yeah, something needs to be taken care of, you know, pretty darn soon. So <laughs> that's what happens with that. Um, and then we got to go out and serve the person and saying, hey, look, here's the judge. The judge wants you to show up at this, you know, within 24 hours at this place. And that the place can be outpatient to their outpatient treatment provider, or it could be, at the ER kind of thing, and they meet with us. Um, and logistically, those are very difficult, tracking down the patient, you know, meeting with the judge, scheduling a, a point, a time to meet with the person in the ER. And they, the presumption is they come in voluntarily. If they don't show up, in the prescribed time within 24 hours, then we go out and go, you know, issue um, a custody authorization based on, hey, here's the judge's order to, for the person to show up. We try to get them to show up. They've been served that appointment in time. They failed to show. And now we're asking you, the county sheriff, to go out and pick them up and bring them in to the ER to see us and then we'll do the evaluation or get them in the hospital um, because the judge has already ordered that to happen. <laughs> um, and so then we're hoping the bed is there. Non-emergent orders don't go across county lines. So, you know, if that bed is, is no longer available at the time the uh, identified client shows up it's like now what do we do so generally those are very rare to happen um but they are an option um so then you know you have the um, the initial emergency detainment of 120 hours during that time that's really just an evaluation phase the person can refuse medications as long as they're you know acting relatively uh, they're not tearing up the psych unit. Then there's the 14-day petition hearings. Um, basically, you can see there's uh, two parts. The initial, uh, did, I, did the uh, ITA officer have uh, a reasonable cause for the detention? If, if it's deemed in that first phase of this hearing that they didn't, then the second part of the argument for commit for the 14-day commitment based on preponderance does not move forward. Um, there's four basic uh, options: the you know um, before and and prior to the hearing, they can be released. They can sign as a voluntary. At the hearing, the judge orders you know for a 14-day more restrictive inpatient kind of uh, commitment or the they can agree or negotiate um, 
the, the both the client and and the court you know will can and the treatment team says hey look you know let's let's do a 90 or 180 day less restrictive outpatient kind of thing and then you have the 90 180 day kind of deal now the thing here's the theory about all this these um hearings and orders for commitment is the i is is a, the underlying idea is that the person has the opportunity to experience reasonable treatment and during that reasonable treatment they go aha i now understand why i need mental health treatment and based on my experience and success of treatment and my life has become better I'm going to continue on treatment I no longer have to have have a court telling me to do so so that's the ideal okay the reality is a lot of times that doesn't happen um, and so from the judicial standpoint is it used to be a person could get committed into generally the state hospital and they'd be there for years decades okay and um of course attorneys said oh you know civil rights attorneys and and defense attorneys said no this isn't right and so then what the 14 day 90 day 180 day kind of thing is basically the patients or the clients right to a judicial review at certain prescribed times or periods and so um there are rather relatively rare um people get 180 day uh, orders and then another 180 day order another 180 day order and another 180 day order they can roll over so let's say at oh what is that uh, about a day 165 um the outpatient treatment team is consulting with and working with an involuntary treatment officer saying hey look we need uh, another 180 day less restrictive court order um so let's get together okay you know i will write the petition and you guys come in and testify um so that's how that kind of works then you have the revocation which the person is on the order but you are revoking them back to inpatient or outpatient Re revocation to outpatient uh it rarely happens um but it happens with revoking a person back to the inpatient piece and so basically, um, an involuntary treatment officer meets the person, usually in the ER, and says, hey, look, things aren't going too well, or you're not abiding by your conditions of your order, um, taking you into custody for up to five days. And then if the inpatient treatment team wants to keep you longer, then you will have a revocation hearing at the revocation hearing you know there's the evidentiary phase and the dis dispositional phase and you know you could have a modified or an additional 80 a 90 or 180 day court order or there could be some modifications to the less restrictive court order and the person is then let go again uh, perhaps under some additional or modified conditions of their court order so uh just one little note here more restrictive court order means they're in the hospital less restrictive court order means they're out of the hospital so i have rattled on here for coming up uh about an hour and 20 minutes uh it's a little longer than i'd hoped but um that kind of presents again the whole piece of this process so uh, just to review there's the referral piece 
um, where we're receiving information, the investigation piece where we're actively evaluating, then, you know, the the evidence to detain is the causal nexus piece. So I wanted folks to really understand that. I kind of went off the rails and did the uh, the dispositional piece. So I get, I'll beg for a few more minutes. So the dispositional piece, once I've detained, decided the pe person meets criteria, then I got to go find the hospital where, where a bed is available. Um, and then make sure that the client is, no, and perhaps family members are notified, hey, this is where this is. But that 120 hours doesn't start until I have a psychiatric bed with a psychiatrist saying, yes, we will take them. And if I don't have that, I don't have a detainment because I don't have any place to detain a person. So. The counting of the hours, of the 120 hours, doesn't start until there is a psychiatrist in, in a bed willing to take them. Now, here's the thing. I call up the, the unit, the psychiatric unit, often talk with the charge nurse or even the psychiatrist and say, look, here's what I got. Here's what I think I have. You know, here's what's been happening. Here's what's been happening out in the community. Here's my investigation, here's my mental status, here's how the person's behaving, and all that kind of stuff. Here's what we've done in the ER to rule out the medical pieces. And um, so, are you willing to take them? Please take, take them. Um, and their piece from their end is, do we have the capacity and availability uh, or capab and a capability of handling and taking this person and being able to reasonably provide treatment. Now, based on the um, activities of the unit from all the other patients, if it's a 20 bed unit, so, you know, I'm getting their last bed, bed number 20, they have 19 other patients that they're taking care of. Do they have a have the ability staffing wise um, to do that with nurses with uh, psych techs? Um, do they have enough docs to cover that? Maybe you know they are down to one doc, and the one doc seeing twenty people every day is a bit difficult. So sometimes um, psychiatric units will cap at say even though the, uh, at fifteen beds because they just don't have enough psychiatrists for the next day or two. Um, sometimes it's like, well, we're expecting discharges tomorrow, but we don't have a bed today. You know, can you call back tomorrow? <laughs> And so, you know, oftentimes this disposition piece can last quite a while. Um, you know, and I, you know, people either do the shotgun approach is like, I'm calling every bed, every hospital I can find down the I-5 corridor. And the first one that says yes, gets them, <laughs> okay? Or, you, or, there's other times when you go one by one by one by one, knock on, on each uh, hospital door. Now, um, just because I have the, the authority to detain a person, I don't have the authority to make create a bed or make a hospital take this client. Um, and so it's, it's a negotiation, it's a process, it's a negotiation, it's a logistical um, thing that happens. And some of this can be just nightmarishly fluid. Um, there's been times where I say, hey, okay, you got a bed, you got beds? Well, great, I want this bed, where am I in line? Oh, you're second in line. And then okay, great, I'll take that, you know. So they said, yeah, we're bringing in another person, and so can you send them at, after 4 o'clock in the morning? They go, great. And then I get a call 20 minutes later, oh, hey, we can't take the person because we had another person walk into our ER in, in King County in Seattle, and that 
uh, involuntary treatment officer is taking that bed because that patient is in that hospital. So because of these uh, federal EMTALA laws, labor and delivery laws and stuff like that, the person that's in their hospital ER, if they have a psych bed, that person gets precedence. So there's a lot of fluidity there and things cha can change moment to moment. Um, and there's can be all kinds of issues. You know, I've had cases where, you know, I had this one case where, okay, we'll take the person. Okay, great. They're loaded up. They're coming to you. They're beyond the ambulance in 45 minutes. And then, you know, and then at that point, this is, I'm, I'm sending the originals with the client on the ambulance and I'm faxing you a copy. Well, you know, three hours later, after I thought this was done, you know, I find out that the person went there, but that unit refused to take them and sent them to another unit. And it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't write the papers for them to be t detained at this other unit. I wrote them to be detained at the unit that turned them away. And so they, there's, uh, there can be all kinds of little snafus and stuff. And so I just wanted to kind of explain some of this that, that oftentimes there's times when you can, I, I can walk in and it's a pretty straightforward case. I interview the person. It's obviously, you know, they, they need detainment. I got some great records, I, you know, and, you know, all I have to do is spend a few minutes and I can see, look, I don't need to sit down and talk with the person for a couple hours to figure this out. They might meet criteria to be detained. And, and so at the actual deci uh, decision to detain a person can be very quick. You know, it's like, boom. Yeah, they're detainable. I'm detaining them. But then it takes me four or six hours to try to find a bed. Um, and now, okay, they, this never used to happen. But now, sometimes we can't find a bed. So then what happens? So that's one of the um, big challenges for some these days is we don't have the beds and the person is detainable. So the thought is, hey, look, they're detainable. I can't find a bed. Um, hospital, ER, they're your patient. I, I got to do a walk away. I've tried my best. And now hospital, they're your patient. What do you want to do? You know, that's up to you. I have no purview. Um, on where they could place a person, a person, or anything like that. And so, back to the, the the disposition is again, you know, all I can do is ask a hospital to open up one of their beds. They get to decide where they put the person. Sometimes we're detaining people to the hospital. We're not detaining them to the unit. So the hospital may feel this person is more appropriate at this point in time because of um, some some medical issues to put them in a medical bed. I have no purview in that. That is the hospital's decision. Um, so that's the dispositional kind of phase. It, it can be nightmarish. It is fluid. Um, it is not necessarily straightforward. Um, so I'm at an hour and a half here. Thanks for hanging in with me. Um, I hope you folks find some usefulness to this. Um, and perhaps, you know, if you think it might be of interest to somebody else or something, pass it along, share it, um, invite them to, to subscribe or comment, like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, what I am presenting, I've done uh, for quite a few different stakeholders, NAMI, National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, the local chapters, police, school counselors, and stuff like that. Um, part of the reason why I decided to do this is I'm out of that game now. I love, I loved it. I did it for 25 years. And, and um, anyway, as far as I know, it's very rare 
to have um, some insight and access to this information. It's just not available. When you're in that game, that environment, doing this work, there are some professional standards that where it's like, oh, you can't talk about some of this stuff. But since I'm out, I decided, hey, in our current, uh, current events situations, um, there's a great need for mental health. A lot of times people don't understand how this works and why it works or doesn't work. So I'm just putting it out there um, for the communities and families and individuals, um, um, you know, for their thought, for their considerations. Um, and I can assure you there is not many places this is provided. It's not taught in graduate school. This is from experience. Um, even though I was a statewide trainer for a while, you know, people were only invited to this kind of information. So um, there you go. Um, thanks and I bless you guys. I love you guys. And um, yeah. So next week is part three, which are kind of the odds and ends of some of this, which I'll get into some of the things that oftentimes people don't consider. Um, but I find that they were interesting and challenging. And so there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Turn up the volume.